So are we good to go, Ruth? All right. All right. Well, everybody, um, welcome and thanks for coming to the second in the series of webinars on um, disaster animal sheltering. I don't know how many of you were here with the last one. Um, this second series is um, specific to the setup of the disaster shelter. If you have any questions while I'm, I'm talking, if you want to type it into the chat, and I'll try and adjust the, um, address those questions as they come up. So um, all of these series have been sponsored um, through a grant from the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Uh, it was given to uh, Pet Aid Colorado and the Colorado Vet um, Veterinary Medical Reserve Corps, which is um, under the guidance of uh, Deborah Schnockenberg. This is my contact information, so if you have any follow-up questions, um, my information is here, and also at the end of the presentation, all of Deborah's contact information will be up for you also, so you can address follow-up questions with her. And then um, we will have all of these up online for a um, second follow-up in the series. So. Getting started here, um, the goals of this is what we're going to look at are, because it's specific to the shelter setup, what we want to look at is the types of animal shelters that you might be running. And we addressed that a lot more in the first um, session, but with this one what I'm going to gear it towards is specifically what we're looking at in in setting it up, in staffing it, how we're going to define those positions and how we're going to arrange the facility based on the type of operation you're running. And so we'll look at both the co-located shelter, um, which if you remember from last time or if you weren't here, the co-location are the shelters that are going to have owned animals at the facility in the immediate proximity of the human shelter. And then the adapt disaster evacuation shelter, which is primarily geared as a stray shelter, although you may have some owners um, that are going to be there and providing care. They're just not located right next to the shelter like they are with the co-located shelter. So, and I'll get into a lot more detail with that. Um, the big thing with the setup is, first of all, safety. Everything we're doing in the disaster, in, in any, any sheltering operation and everything you do in life, safety needs to be primary focus. With this what we're looking at is the safety for the people and the animals and the people being both your folks who are working in the shelter, owners who are going to be in the shelter providing care, visiting their animals and members of the public who are going to be coming to the shelter who are looking for their stray pets. So in how we set it up the, we can add safety to it based on what type of sheltering we're doing, the amount of volume we're going to have in the facility, the different unknowns, um, people who are coming in looking for pets or providing care, those kind of things. In the setup of the shelter, the biggest thing with the disaster shelter is that you create it so it can create a flexible setup. You don't know what's coming into the shelter, how many are coming in, when they're coming in, so making it as simple as possible, and we'll talk about ways of going about doing that, but how do you set up the shelter to create the flexibility to allow you to accommodate the majority of the animals that are coming in, and then you only have to scramble for those outliers in, in plans to set up. So if you have an animal, a dog that's too large for the crates that you have, that's an outlier. You're going to need to have a plan for just those kind of animals or too small. But the majority of your animals should fit into the plan for the setup. And then looking at the efficiency, efficiency in the arrangement is for your volunteers who are going to be doing all of the work, efficiency on how the animals are moving through the facility, um, how supplies are getting in and out of the facility, and then controlling the traffic for the members of the public who are also going to be coming in, especially if they're going to be walking them. 
So with your companion animal shelters, you have owned and stray animals in whether it's co-located or whether it's an evacuation shelter, you'll have owned and, and stray. Your large animal shelter, or your livestock shelter, you are going to have owned and stray animals in those facilities as well. Generally, the large animals were not doing um, co-located in terms of they, how they are with the companion animals. So you're not going to have, like with the co-located shelter we talked about last week, you'll have a school, for example, and you have people living or staying in the school, and then you have the animals in another part of the building. We're not going to have that so much with the large animals. What you generally have are fairgrounds, livestock facilities, those kind of operations. And you may have some owners who are on site because they're in their horse trailers or they're setting up tents or they're wanting to be near those large animals. Generally what we have with these large animals and the livestock, these are show animals. So you have people who are going to be hanging out with those, particularly if you get into more of the livestock piece of it. For your co-located shelter, I recommend that you keep those as owned animals only, that you're not going to have strays coming into that facility. That means you're going to have to run multiple facilities because you're going to have another location where the strays are taken. That's your disaster evacuation shelter. Um, so, with your companion animal shelters in an environment where you have co-location, you're going to have a lot of traffic in and out. The people are living right next door. They don't have anything else to do. They're coming and going at their hours. You'll have people who come in, pick their animals up in the morning and want to just hang out with them all, all day. There's nothing else for them to do and just hanging out in the human shelter. Um, is can be a challenging, depressing, difficult environment. It's just the difficulty. Nothing to say about the human shelter. They do a fabulous job, but look at the reality of it where you have lost everything or you don't know if you've lost anything. There's a lot of stress being in that environment. The animal shelter they're coming over, if it's a dog, they're coming over and they're picking up their dog and they're wanting to be someplace with it. So part of the setup with this is also thinking about um, do you have an outside area that people can hang out, um, set it up, you know, picnic tables or whatever it happens to be where they can just sit and hang out with the family and their pet. Um, with the setup of the shelter, um, the amount of care that people are providing or, um, or what co-location means in some regard in that is the shelter right next door? Can they walk right over and take the animals or can they walk right down the hall and get their animals? Or are they having to be transported from another location? And I've seen this at um, universities, for example where it's considered a co-location shelter, but the people are being housed across campus, and so it's not an easy walk for them to get to the animal shelter, and so there's actually buses transporting them to that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the ability to provide care may vary a little bit depending on where you have them. With your large animal shelter, I already mentioned, you're going to have both owned and stray animals at this facility. Um, with the large animals, what you have, know your community. You'll know if you have, you know, llamas, alpacas. Um, is there a big F, F8 um, uh, contingency so that you're going to have kids that are going to be showing other farm animals, those kind of things. So you may have those kind of animals coming in. Generally what we don't see are the um, the livestock that is set up for farms, especially if you have large scale farms in your area. You're not going to be having those animals generally coming into your facility. Um, with, this is an org chart, and I believe all of you have taken the um, ICS trainings. So if, um, if you look at how this chart is set up, the 
there's always the Office of Emergency Management is it going to be at the top. You're going to have the section chief um, for the animals and then under that you'll have your animal branch director. Breaking off um, from those positions, if you look at the chart in green, with your um, rescue evacuation group supervisor and the large animal shelter group supervisor in purple on the other side. I don't have those charts laid out. I'll cover the large animal in when we target specifically to the large animal group. Um, but essentially what you're going to have underneath are going to be what you see in the lighter blue. So you have your small animal shelter group supervisor. You're going to have a veterinary manager underneath there and then underneath them is going to be the veterinary team lead and then the additional team members. And then it's going to be the same thing with your logistics manager. You'll have a logistic lead and the logistic team members. Facility manager and their team members. Generally you don't need a lead but it certainly depends on the size of the operation. And then the focus here um, that we'll spend most of our time focusing on is going to be under the temporary small animal shelter supervisor and those positions for your intake and documentation team and then for your animal care team leads and team members. Now keep in mind with the incident command system, the org chart, the positions that you need are positions you'll fill. You may need all of these positions. You may not need all of these positions. It's going to be directly related to the scope of your disaster and how many positions you need to fill. And so if you look under the large animal shelter, I would recommend that you do um, a small animal org chart and then you do a large animal org chart and underneath that including that you would have a veterinary manager for your large animal that you wouldn't try and share positions like your vets aren't going to be at the small animal shelter and the large animal shelter it's going to be pretty overwhelming to try and do that that's not to say that logistics couldn't potentially serve multiple functions depending on the again on the scope of your disaster um, but you're going to have to design your org chart based on what the needs of that disaster is and every disaster because those will vary from from disaster to disaster and again if you guys have any questions about anything um, jump in but then I'm going to go into detail on all of these positions so your leadership roles, and this is generally what I've found that I like and that works really well. I mean, these positions are already there, um, but I view these three people as the leadership positions in the team. And I think it's really important in that these three people are able to work really well together um, and and they're able to tackle the scope of the disaster much better if they're working together on those and particularly when it comes to planning the setup of the shelter these three people I see is the key people in that so you have your shelter supervisor the safety officer and every shelter should have a safety officer assigned to that facility um, and then your lead veterinarian so the layout of the shelter then you're going to look at the pieces that you need to put in there so f first of all you have your animal housing animal housing is broken down into the different types of animals that you have and then also the other issues that might come up throughout and and I'll break down animal housing in detail um, but what you have with your dogs your cats um, and and then your veterinarian and the vet station. You're going to have an intake area. Um, staffing, we want to be taking care of all volunteers. So the um, staff break area, which may or may not be in the facility, it may be outside the facility. And then where are all of your supplies coming in? And you will get a lot of supplies, an unbelievable amount of donations, water and food and unimaginable things are going to be coming in. So you need to plan an area where you can warehouse all of those supplies that then will move into the shelter for use. Eat cleaning and feeding stations and these I generally have um, 
set up with specific areas of animal housing. So each unit or section, different species, all of those are going to have cleaning and feeding stations inside the disaster shelter. You're going to need a cleaning and sanitation area outside of the shelter or in a safe place within the facility. And then other considerations, which are big considerations as part of the facility, is um, where the restrooms are and the um, waste removal. So your dumpsters and then actually all the trash cans and stuff throughout the facility. And we will go into more detail with all of this. That's just your overview. So, um, so your shelter supervisor, they are the overall leader within the shelter. They report up to the branch director, um, but they specifically are going to be the head of this operation. For that, the initial starting up is what the layout of the facility is going to be. Shelter supervisor is setting up that layout. Now, that being said, as part of what I talked about last week is that you're pre-planning. You're finding facilities ahead of time. You're planning what a layout could look like. So you're sectioning off in a written plan where things are going to be set up within the shelter or at least plans depending on what's coming in. You may have daily routines, um, standard operating procedures that are already written out, and then the staffing of it with your caregivers. Those things may be pre-planned as part of your disaster plan. If it's not already a plan, spur of the moment, the shelter supervisor is going to have to come up with that plan, the layout, what the routines are, and work out all of those details. But hopefully you've got some plans in the works and it's it's going to be the shelter supervisor is simply working out the finer details specific to the operation but they have the SOPs already in place. The shelter supervisor is going to be working very closely with the field manager on what animals are coming in. These are your your animal search and rescue teams or your animal control teams that are going to be um, the field manager is going to be communicating what's happening in that, which is critical information for the shelter. So if you're taking in stray animals and you have a, um, a truck full of 50 animals showing up at the shelter, that communication is going to be happening prior to it arriving, so the shelter can be prepared and start getting things set up and ready to intake those animals when they come in. So with the shelter supervisor, the plan for the shelter, um, and one of the things that I do anytime I walk into a shelter, I'm, I was always walking into an unknown space. So we would get there, we would get on scene, and then plan out the facility. You know that you're going to have various species that are going to be there, dogs and cats primarily, but then you're also going to have these other animals. You'll have your your um, reptiles well and this goes into what are you planning to take are you taking just those FEMA companion animal designated animals or are you taking anything that comes in so you may have reptiles you may have amphibians you're going to have exotics you'll have your rabbits and your birds and chickens and unknown number of animals that may be coming into this facility you can plan the big ones you're planning for are your dog and cat areas and then your outlier areas those other species that could be coming in so looking at that space looking at what potential animals may be coming into your facility and then trying to lay out a plan on where you're going to set those animals up and i'll get into even more detail in the housing on where we do that the area for intake and documentation, looking at where people are going to be coming into the facility for the most efficient flow as people come in to fill out the paperwork on the animals they're dropping off, um, and then the storage where those, where those supplies are going to go for the efficiency of your workers to be able to access those supplies. Shelter supervisor is setting all of that stuff up. <clears throat> so your safety officer, for the safety, their primary function is overall scene safety. 
where what's happening throughout the day, throughout the setup, um, you're primarily looking at the volunteers and the workers. But for as the operation gets on, then the safety of all of the people that are in there. Safety officers should only be doing safety. They're not going to be also an animal handler or also logistics. They need to be focusing on just where these animals, how these animals are being handled, that they're not escaping. It may be setting up perimeter fencing. It may be setting up specific exercise yards, um, but they're just overall wandering through the facility and keeping track of, you know, how's go what's going on. A lot of the focus on the people is going to be on the staff volunteers those folks get really overwhelmed with what's going on and you have people who are so focused on providing care for the animals that they're not taking care of themselves and so safety officer is going to be watching those people making sure they're taking on water making sure they're taking on breaks and monitoring the conditions in the facility as far as temperature um, and based on heat index there may be mandatory breaks every hour, or every few hours for volunteers, staff to sit down, take in some water, and just take a few minutes. And those are all established by the safety officer. Um, as far as the overall setup of the shelter, they're going to evaluate the facility based on what's happening in in the in operation initially so do they need to make repairs that you have to have the dogs in this particular area or the cats in this particular room do they need to make any repairs to that space or any modifications putting up um, construction fencing so animals can't escape that's their main job as they walk through the facility, they're going to coordinate with the shelter supervisor any concerns they have for safety, any concerns for possible risk of losing animals, um, and then um, safety concerns as far as evening hours, nighttime hours for the overnight shifts as far as keeping everybody safe in it. Um, I would recommend the safety officer also um, make sure there's a list of where the nearest hospitals are, emergency facilities, uh, utilities are also good things for safety officer to have available. So the lead veterinarian, their responsibility is or is for the animals, for the health and well-being of them. They're going to establish or at least enforce the protocols that are established for medical intake. That varies from region to region and I know Colorado is working on some very very specific kind of things on what they're planning to do. But with the overall, once the operation gets going, that they're continuing to monitor the welfare of the animals. But initially coming in, are you going to have a veterinarian assess the health of every single animal that enters the facility? Are they vaccinating those animals on intake if there aren't vaccines or if they don't have proof of vaccines? Um, you're going to need to establish what those protocols are and then have the staffing to be able to do that. Additionally, that through the course of the operation, are there going to be medications that are going to be given to these animals, um, certainly the sick animals, are they being treated within the facility, but then also you may have animals that are coming in that um, or own daily medications, and so the veterinarian will be able um, overseeing all of those pieces of it. If an animal, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still trying to get over my cold, so uh, pardon me. Um, with the um, with animals that come into the facility that need advanced medical care, we're not able to provide them for it within the shelter. Those animals could be sent out to a vet clinic or an emergency vet hospital. The lead veterinarian's responsibility is to follow up on those animals and to keep track of the needs of those animals because they're still overseeing those unless they are just signed 
over the it's an owned animal it's just signed over by the owner to that emergency clinic um, and the lead veterinarian will be overseeing those processes their primary focus is going to be on the welfare of the animals um, health wise in the operation so going through and doing daily inspections doing the rounds of the shelter to see what the condition of the animals are um, they're going to have a vet station that they're going to be able to do the work from um, and then also as I mentioned before what are the intake procedures are they triaging animals on intake um, the primarily fee, um, field animals there should be a triage station outside of the, the disaster shelter where an, there's a vet set up to do all the triage from the field so in that the animals that we're getting at the animal shelter are only animals who've already been looked at they don't have any immediate medical need uh, looking at a lot of times what we're looking at dehydrated animals so they're either getting fluids in the field or they're being sent someplace where they can get either sub Q or IV fluids um, and then they're coming to the disaster shelter so the triaging hopefully is being done in the field uh, but you may have where people are doing a mass evacuation they're grabbing their animals and bringing them in so having a vet who can look at those animals when they first come in is going to be you know important it's a possibility that you have to do that so um, staffing the shelter then aside from the leadership people what you have is um, lots and lots of volunteers ideally these are all trained volunteers so they've been through a screening process they've taken the incident command courses they have some sort of experience working with animals working in a shelter working in a disaster shelter they've got something already in place if you aren't going to have all enough of those people or you don't have those people then you're gonna have to establish a just-in-time training program and then with that just-in-time program what you're doing is you're breaking down very very briefly what ICS means which is do what you're told to do report to the one person you're told to report to um, you know whatever that looks like in getting the people so that they can fit into the system without without jeopardizing the system and you're gonna have to have with that a level of understanding on why it's being done this way it's not it's a disaster shelter so the protocols that we have in place are because it's a disaster shelter so and these are owned animals or we're trying to find the owners so the just-in-time training is gonna have to prep those members of the public that may be well intended but they don't they don't understand what it's like to be in a disaster animal shelter so for the planning piece of it um, so your leadership team so your safety officer your lead veterinarian and your shelter supervisor they're they're planning out the layout or like I said if you've already got a plan you know your facility you've got a plan laid out then they're simply taking that plan and they're putting it into action in the shelter with the need potentially for some modifications um, based on the disaster and animals that are coming in it's a disaster you have to be flexible there's always modifications that need to be made so but this leadership team is going to find the best placement for animals looking at what the needs of each particular species are and then what the availability is based on the space that they're using one of the big things that I like to focus on that I I see in the past has been missed quite a bit when setting up the disaster shelter is airflow and looking at how air is moving through the facility so that it's hitting the healthy animals it's coming through the shelter it's pushing out the any of the sick animal and then outside the facility ideally you would have a completely different building or room or space 
that you could separate animals that are sick but there's not always the availability to have an ISO area that's going to be completely separated from your healthy animals um, so you're going to have to plan that in the airflow with that is temperature control because disasters are generally happening in the summer months where you have really high temperatures so controlling the temperature and making sure that our fans being set up to create a positive airflow moving healthy air uh, clean air through the shelter and out or are the fans being set up for temperature control because fans being shifted to cool animals off is now shifting your airflow and potentially spreading contaminants through the shelter. Regardless of the temperature, you have to have fresh air coming into the facility and moving the stale air out. This is particularly a challenge in the cold weather um, because you're going to not want to be bringing cold air into the, the companion animal shelter, but you absolutely have to have airflow of some sort moving it through um, the, and I guess that goes to say too in the hot weather if you have air conditioning you still can't have stale air you've got to have some sort of positive airflow again if there are any questions please feel free to type in if you have questions <coughs> excuse me so for your volunteers and your staff as leadership is planning out what where areas are going to be set up they can get started and it's best I mean generally our volunteers they did not sit well most volunteers want to be busy they want to get right to work they don't want to be sitting around waiting for the facility to get you know planned out so with that what you want to do is get them to start cleaning up the facility anything that needs to be you know repaired you have tarps that need to be hung or tarps put down um, fencing that's going to be put up they can start taking care of those kind of things under the direction of the team leads um, which is going to come then you know from the safety officer or from the shelter supervisor they're going to be setting up equipment you can see in this picture these are all bowls that were being washed and set up to air dry looks like some wiping off bowls that they were starting to get wiped off um, as well so they're going to be starting to to get that together foods coming in so they're organizing food laying it out by you know species and type and all of those things and getting things organized so keep them busy Additionally, they can start setting up the shelter. And with that, what you have here with these cages, um, you have the wire cages. If the pop up cages are ideal, but with that, if you notice the zip ties on each of these four corners of the cage, you're going to be putting zip ties on each one of these corners all the way front and back of the pen. And so, what we want to do is get them popped up, get the corner zip tied, the zip ties then get cut down so they're not sticking out like this where an animal can get poked by it or a volunteer or staff can get poked by it um, and then the pens are going to be laid out according to the plan for setup which if you don't have that plan yet um, they can just stack them in a space and then set up the shelter from there. You see the boxes here if you're lucky enough to have the boxes um, that the the um, cages came in then you're going to want to keep those because we're going to use those as dividers in the shelter all right so with your design I talked about having flexibility and with that is looking at what the unknowns are going to be do you know primarily what species are in your area what the companion animals are from the people um, who be bringing them in and if you're in a high tourist area also making considerations for tourists who may be bringing their animals with them on vacation what are the numbers of animals that are going to be coming in first of all what's your population the number of animals based on your population and then um, adding to it what potentially you could have in if you've got tourists so being able to look at those numbers and plan for those possible evacuations tourists certainly can you know 
potentially get in their cars and leave. Um, they, if you're in an area that they can get out that's not been cut off from access. So plan for those things. You're going to look at what the needs of the animals are going to be health-wise. Are they sick? Are they pregnant? Um, what kind of medications, what kind of injuries might be coming in based on the disaster? And then when are they coming? Are you getting the call because the fire is already erupted and people are being evacuated and you're just racing to the shelter to start setting up your shelter and you've got people already waiting in line to come in? Um, and then finally, what's the departure? How long is this operation going to be running? Because we all know that, you know, disaster it's not quick and especially if it's impacted a lot of homes, a lot of people, how long are they going to be displaced? Well, reality is, is they could be displaced for months, a year. You're not running the shelter for that long, so what's your plans for, you know, when you're closing down your facility? How long will you have to be operating? Um, creating flexibility in it is in, can be with used with equipment. So looking at what equipment you have coming in, do you have pre-established or ordered cages? And so if you have that standard that all dogs, you have extra large cages planned for them, cats, you have large cages planned for them, um, that helps with the flexibility of the setup because then you can go through and you just line all of your cages up in the area that you have and an animal comes in, it goes into that pen and then the next animal comes in, goes into the next pen. That way you're not setting up, well this is our small dog area or a large dog area and this is, you know, for cats, this less size variation than when we have with the dogs um, but if you're having multiple family units coming in by being able to use the same size cages you're pre-setting up that and you're not having to plan because really do you know how many small dogs are coming in or how many large dogs are coming in you can't create those spaces so one space creates the area a difference with that may be if you're trying to separate and create a puppy area to prevent parvo, you know, the spread of diseases with the puppies that haven't been fully vaccinated yet. Um, that is a separate area that you may be establishing, but again, you can do all same size cages for those areas um, and, and create that flexibility. The separation, um, if you have separate rooms that you can put them in, so you have a cat room, it's a contained room, it's quieter than the dog room, um, but generally we're not going to have separate rooms for all of these different animals and again that's a limiting factor because if you have a room and you end up with three times the number of cats that you planned for that room, now you're looking for additional space. Space between cages can be a barrier. We don't generally have the flexibility of that large an operation that we can use the amount of space we need to be a health barrier. Um, so we're using some kind of physical barrier. If you're using the cardboard boxes, that physical barrier works for those animals. But if you change out and you put a different animal into a cage, just like you're going to clean and sanitize that cage to put a new animal in, you have to do that with the barrier. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a question here as if people are bringing their animals to the shelter in a carrier, which hopefully they are, um, do we allow those to be stored on site? Uh, we've done it both ways. I've had it where we did have the carriers and we put them on top of the cages or we kept them in a different room um, labeled. That adds another dimension to it because we've had, got to keep track of these. If they're just on the cages, there's a potential for those cages to the carriers to be stolen uh, and we don't want to be responsible for that. Ideally, they bring them in the cage. My opinion, ideally, they bring them in their carrier we put them into the cage it's going to be kept in and then the owners take those carriers back with them. But you can do it either way. It's easier if they're responsible for them. 
for the dogs, um, this generally is the largest space that you're going to need in the shelter to plan for the dogs. We generally have more dogs and with them you need bigger spaces. I don't recommend stacking dog crates. Um, there, there's a lot more activity in and out, larger animals. We don't want to be lifting large animals up into a second level of crate. Um, and so with that, it, it takes up a lot more space. With the dog area, the other thing is to consider where the exit is to the exercise yard or exercise yards if you're going to have multiple exercise areas. So you need to have them in proximity to those entrances and exits to the exercise yard. And I, as I already mentioned, I recommend doing extra large wire kennels for the dog area. Um, with the uh, dogs lining the kennels up side by side and back to back, you need to have a barrier between the sides and then between the back area. Oops, sorry. Um, the barriers serve, as I mentioned, as a disease barrier, but also as a visual barrier. Now, with these, um, if you have multi-family units with these, that visual barrier can be lifted so they, if they don't both fit in the one kennel, you can lift the, the barrier so that they can still see each other. You can lift it part way so they can have privacy if they want privacy, um, But because we don't have to worry about the disease because they came from the same household. But you may want to still give them some kind of a barrier for them. If you are planning on putting family units into the single extra large cage, they're smaller dogs so they fit, um, if you plan on doing that then really watch with the resource guarding. And I have people all the time, they come in and we're like, oh they love each other, they get along really well. Well yeah, in your you know, 1,500 square foot home, 1,000 square foot apart, whatever that looks like, yes, they, they aren't resource guarders, they do get along. But now when they're put in an extra large wire crate, it's a highly stressful environment, those behaviors often can change. So, you know, I'm not opposed to putting them in together because a lot of times they really do better together. Um, but it may be that feeding time, they're not going to be okay together. So do you have a separate pen you can put them in for feeding and then keep them together the rest of the time? Or you simply put them side by side and give them, you know, the barrier removal so they have their space but they can see each other. For your cats. With your cats, um, it's it's generally a smaller space. We tend to have fewer cats, and I don't know if that's because people can, you know, they're going to stay with family or friends, and they can keep the cat in the room, or you know, they can sneak them into the hotel, whatever that looks like. We tend to have fewer of those coming in. The other thing with it is it can be a smaller space because stacking the cages works fine with cats. I wouldn't go any more than too high. You never want people having to stand up onto something to get into the cage and you never want to be pulling an animal out of a cage down to you down towards your face. So too high is the limit. With the cats, can you put them in an area that has um, less traffic? So less of dogs going in and out. Um, less people coming in, like you don't want it near the intake area where it's going to be a really busy area. So just a quieter, calmer area for them. And certainly if it can be separated that you have them in their own, in their own room, their own space, quieter away from the barking dogs, that's certainly ideal. With the large wire kennels, you have enough room, you can put in a litter box, you can maybe put in a box or a smaller carrier for them to hide in. Um, it just gives them a lot more space in there to, I mean, keep in mind they're living in that space for the length of the disaster, so the more room you can give them, the better. We're going to do the same thing with the cats, lining them side by side and back to back, and then um, stacked on top of each other. Barrier has to be overlapped between the kennels so that there's no potential of debris falling down into the lower kennels. So you're overlapping the cardboard barrier, whatever your barrier is, on those bottom, bottom pens. 
All right. With the family units, with the cats, we put um, them in together, and a lot of times they really do much better in in being with one another, so they're going to be cuddled up with one another, but we still have to watch to see if there's any kind of um, aggressive behavior towards each other, getting on each other's nerves, sharing a small room, and so those animals may need to be separated. Um, owners tend to like to have them together, so if you are having to separate those guys, um, you're going to probably also have to explain why you're separating them. It's a different environment, it's a disaster environment. The animals are highly stressed, so they are going to behave differently. Um, all right, and then your other animals that are coming in. With these, um, a lot of times the carriers, the crates, we can put you know rabbits in them or we can put different animals into the different size crates potentially you're gonna to have to put them into carriers um, or if they're coming in you know in their own aquarium or their own special cage which is ideal although they may not be coming into those kind of things with these animals accommodating certain species can be challenging particularly when you're looking at your reptiles that are dependent on a light source or heat source this environment can be really difficult to to take the proper care of those kind of animals and if they're not coming in with their tanks and with their you know heat lamps and those kind of things um, it it may not be something we can actually accommodate and so you're going to have to find other options for them. Uh, if you aren't familiar with a particular type of animal, then get the resources, get the people who are, or get these animals to somebody who can take care of them. So for your large animal shelter, having a, a with the fairgrounds, with the agricultural areas, what we have is a pre established stalls, pens, those kind of things that are specifically geared towards your large animal. And so working for the within these facilities, um, in some ways it can be easier it, it, depending on capacity because you already have the stalls set up. You have physical structure there where with the small animal shoulder we're building that out of our carriers and, and pens. If I recommend, first of all, that animals go into stalls. If you have family groups coming in um, and there you have a larger pen area, round pens, those kind of things, um, evaluating what's going to be best, I think they all should be stalled, but you are going to have some groups of animals that you may not have enough space that are family units that would want to be together. Obviously, you really have to watch for resource guarding. Horses are horrible resource guarders. Um, and so watching the dynamics of those herds and the behavior that's going to be going on in those larger spaces where stalled, we can just control those environments. It's safe for the people. It's safer for the animals. If you have multiple buildings, you could certainly separate the different types of species. Um, but that being said, you're going to have a lot of times where you'll have somebody who's bringing in a bunch of sheep and their guard llama. Those animals aren't going to want to be separated. You're going to want to keep those family units together, if at all possible, in the housing um, conditions. So, as I mentioned with the horses, um, stalling them separately because of the resource guarding, incredible food aggression, um, and I've seen animals get injured because you had um, too many grouped in a run. This was a legal case, but they had a bunch of horses that were all grouped together in a run, um, and there was one very dominant mare that chased another horse into the rails, um, and we had an injury out of that horse. So watching them at feeding time and watching the the pens for your stallions I mean obviously if there's mares and stallions in the vicinity of each other they're gonna know if you have a mare in heat um, stallions around other stallions that are gonna be posturing um, because of the mares that are around them so if you can separate them into another building or into a, another space and putting all of those stallions 
with each other in that extra space so we can control that environment. If they're not around the mares, they will they should settle down. But what we want to do is look at protecting the population. And so only people who are familiar with working with stallions should be in that area. Preferably owners are taking care of those animals, um, but we certainly want to make sure that that they're housed in a location where we can control that environment and limit the access to them. If you have bears that have foals still on them, then you're going to want to try and find larger stalls that can accommodate those foals. And mares, um, you may not have the luxury of, of having the birthing stalls that are going to be the larger stalls, but you certainly want to try and make sure that there's enough room in there that it's safe for the mom and the foal, and then for anybody who has to go into that stall to work with them which can be challenging um, in the restrictive environment that you have. With this, considerations for animals that are really, really frightened. Do you have a calm, quiet area or just an area where you can kind of keep track of what's going on with those animals? You can do some extra monitoring for them. In the large animal, um, just like we're going to have with the small animal shelters, we're going to have animals that are going to need an isolation area. With the sick ISO horses or any of the sick large stock, um, is looking at where they're going to be if you've moving them to a different location, proper cleaning, decon protocols for those stalls and then who's providing care for these animals to make sure they're taking whatever extra precautions needs to be so that it's not spread throughout the population. So you're wearing Tyvex and gloves, um, Tyvek suits if you're not familiar with Tyvek. Um, Tyvek is a, a barrier, a vapor barrier material. Um, it's put on over top of the clothing so that the Tyvek can be removed without getting any contamination on the clothing underneath. So. All right. So um, family units in the large animal shelter should be housed near one another so that they're, I mean, you're going to have very bonded herds of horses and, and animals, so you want to keep the those groups together so they can see one another across the aisleway or that they're next to one another. Everything, questions on any of these things, you always want to make sure that you're consulting with your veterinarian, um, especially when it comes to questions about medical, the health and well-being of them, the, the vets involved in helping to decide if we need to do something different with how we're providing care for them. Which the isolation for your um, companion animal housing, your with this you have your sick and your contagious animals. Primarily, what we're concerned about are the contagious things that are going to spread to the rest of the population. If you have an owned animal in the area, that we don't want to have these owned animals coming in and getting getting sick. You're going to have different levels of care that's coming into the shelter. So you'll have people whose animals have never been outside of their home. They're always, you know, to the vet. They have all their vaccines are current. They're well groomed. They're all of these things to animals who are coming in that have potentially been running at large for a month. They're just finally being picked up because of this disaster or just finally being caught because of this disaster. And so you have this whole range of animals. So what we want to do is create an ISO area where the animals can be placed, where they can be treated, and when they can be get, um, get well without contaminating the rest of the population. The other considerations is special needs. And with this, first of all, if, if you, I mean, no disaster is complete without the miracle of birth. So what you have with looking at a special needs area is if you have pregnant animals that are coming in, this is a quieter, calmer area. They can be monitored more closely by medical staff um, or they're just in an area that has a, a targeted group of volunteers who can keep an eye on them. 
Aside from the maternity, the other are animals and elderly are, are one of the key areas and, or key animals for these areas. What you have with your elderly animals is they really struggle in the disaster environment, in the sheltering environment in general, but they just don't do well with the noise and the temperatures and just the stress of being in that environment. So we want to watch them to make sure that they're continuing to eat, um, they're, they're drinking well, and that they're, they're getting the extra attention that we don't end up losing these animals. You'll see some of these guys come in and they just get depressed and they pretty much just quit. So we want to watch them and do what we can in those um, for those animals. You're going to have all the same areas that you need with your large animals. So you'll have an ISO area if you have any sick animals come in. Your maternity um, that you hopefully you don't have a lot of um, mares falling, but that you have a maternity area. The stress of the disaster, the um, changes in pressure due to the disaster, all of those things that could help bring on um, an early delivery. Uh, looking at special needs with those animals, if you have animals that are struggling in the stress of the environment, um, primarily what we have with this as well is that you have um, animals that may be coming in that are injured because of the disaster and so that would be an area that you would put some special needs animals and then as I mentioned before any intact males needs to be a separate area for those intact males um, there's a question is there a formula to figure out volunteer to animal ratio and uh, I don't know that there's a steadfast formula. I do know that when I was with American Humane Association, we had worked out that there was a um, 10 to 100. But with that, there are some extenuating circumstances with that ratio that you have. Um, it depends on the disposition of the animals, how sociable they are, how easy they are to handle, how many dogs are being walked on a regular basis, um, and then what's the quality of your volunteers. Are they skilled handlers? Are they efficient workers? Um, and then with that also looking at um, the time of the disaster. So. At the very beginning, you're going to need a lot more people because the animals aren't into the routine, the people aren't into the routine, there's a lot of people evacuating and just getting to the shelter, and so have planned for more volunteers in the beginning, and then in the end, as animals are leaving, it's a really busy time, um, and then, you know, just circumstances as they change. As the routine gets set, you tend to need a few less volunteers. Um, the other area that you're going to need to consider is um, for bite hold and aggressive animals. And with this talking beforehand with um, the jurisdictional authority on where are bite cases being held and is that at your disaster shelter just in a flagged off section or in another room or space um, or do they have to go to your animal control facility or the local shelter or to a vet hospital you know what are those plans for those animals generally it's um, generally they've been housed in the disaster shelter because there's not space for them or logistically trying to get them to another facility and then track them and monitoring them it's it can be a challenge so uh, you may find that the best place for them is at the disaster shelter um, but it's a challenging environment so if they are there um, outwardly aggressive really difficult animals getting them to an off-site place getting them to animal control um, or to a shelter who can better handle those animals is really is really going to be important. Bites happen for a lot of reasons. It's a high stress environment, so it could be you know an animal that is perfectly fine, but just you know it happens. Um, but with them, whatever wherever we put them, they should be handled 
by skilled handlers who understand what they're working with um, and they need to be kept away from the rest of the population and away from the public because they are on a 10-day quarantine. So for your vet, if you have veterinarians involved in the initial planning process, where the veterinary area is going to be um, is going to be quieter and calmer area. They can they can help determine where it's going to be best for them to be able to do the work that they're going to do. And that goes back to what are they doing? Are they doing exams on intake, or are they just providing care during the course of the operation? But generally, it's going to be a quieter, calmer area where they can focus on the work that they need to do. It's going to be a less accessible area because they will have needles, they will have their medications, um, their rabies logs, all of those kind of things that they're going to want to keep secure. And um, and it want you want to have them some proximity, um, looking at health obviously and airflow, but in some proximity to the ISO animals so they can oversee those types of animals. In this area we want to make sure that there's good power source. They may need supplemental lighting to be able to see what they're doing. If you can have refrigeration for them to keep their vaccines and medications in a refrigerator, otherwise it may simply be in a cooler. Um, but it needs to be secure that it can be locked up um, or they're taking stuff back and forth with them as they come and go. And then if there's a place for them to fill out paperwork, they'll be documenting all of the care, certainly any treatments that they're giving, any medication they're giving, and then at the end of the event, uh, potentially doing health certificates if you have animals that you're shipping to other states for, um, for care or for placement. So, Your intake area. Your intake area should be near the front of the shelter. You want it to be an open area where there's a lot of space for the people who are going to be coming in. With that, can you separate your intake tables based on species? Um, can you or can you have multiple intake processors so that you can accommodate people very quickly to move the lines through? So in and this goes back to kind of what your formulas are. In the beginning, you're going to need a lot of people for intake and a lot of space for it as the evacuations are called. And so having enough room and enough tables so that people can be filling out paperwork for them. You want intake set up in such a way that it's easy to funnel those species then to wherever they're going to be housed after they come in. For your intake area, you'll have tables and chairs available, and that's chairs also available for the public as they're coming in. They're stressed, they need a place to just sit down, let them fill out that, well, I recommend your intake processors fill out the paperwork, um, but have them sit down while you process them in. Have drinking water available for the people. Um, if animals have been tr coming from a distance and you're having drinking water available for them, if you're putting it into a bowl, that bowl then has to go with that animal to its cage or it has to be picked up and go to cleaning. You don't want a community drinking bowl. You'll need all of your office supplies. Um, slip leads available. Every animal should be contained. So it's on a slip lead or it's in a carrier. And you'll have people who want to just hold them. I've had people walk into the shelter just holding a cat. And you, you know, there are 500 barking dogs and they're like, no, my cat's fine. No, it's not fine. In this facility, we need to have them contained because of the other unknowns. And so make sure even if they're still going to hold their dog or get a slip lead on it. And then um, all of the forms that you're going to have. So the documentation to process the people in, if it's co-located, forms for processing their animals in, your daily care, and then ID bands. The ID bands that will go on the animals and the owners. And then also do you have microchip scanners so you can scan the stray animals that are coming in and get those um, microchips written down and the people contacted. 
So for your break area, this should be away from, it, it, certainly if it can be away from the barking dogs, it can be a quiet or calmer area, but it should also be away from the public. You want to be able to have a place where these people can go and just decompress. Highly stressful, hot, exhausting environment. So they need some place that they can go and get away from all of that. Food, water, a place to sit down, potentially a place to lay down. And um, if it's hot outside, that there's um, a covered place, it's a shady place. Um, we've even had where there's done misters so people could go in and get under the misters to cool off, if depending on the environment. All right, so your donations. Um, you're probably going to have some supplies that you're having to get brought in. Donations may be from members of the public or it may also be, I don't know if you guys are familiar with PetSmart Charities, they bring in a rescue wagon for disaster. Um, it's a semi, I think the last estimate I heard it was about $80,000 worth of equipment for their fully stocked trailers. It's wire cages, it's puppy pads, it's bowls, it's food, it's anything, litter that you can think of, they're going to have on those trailers. So something like that, accommodating those supplies coming in, and then as I mentioned, accommodating all of the other donations and supplies that are going to come to your facility. All of that goes to the warehouse area where it can be organized and can be tracked, and then from the warehouse is where you're going to stock the feeding stations that are within the shelter operation and within the units. So with that, that these this cleaning feeding stations. The cleaning is for the daily cleaning that's being done. So what you have with whatever cleaner you're using, potentially um, you may be doing bleach, although if you can bleach in the the um, actual cleaning decon area rather than within the shelter. I recommend that you use just a daily cleaner on the cages. And then um, the supplies that you're going to have. Each area, like with your dogs, your cats, your puppies, your different units, but ISO is completely separate. For your isolation area, any supply that goes into that area stays in that area and should be labeled ISO. So a broom and a dustpan gets labeled isolation and it stays in that area and doesn't come out. Same thing with food, same thing with gloves. All those supplies need to remain in that area. You'll have a trash can in that area and then that trash gets re immediately removed and taken to the dumpster. All right. So your cleaning and sanitation station. This is where all of the equipment is going to go. So it needs to be a large area for the daily cleaning. Every day the bowls the if you're okay. Any any bowls like food bowls. If you're using metal bowls or, you know, reusable bowls for food, they're going to have to be washed every day. Water bowls can sometimes just be wiped out if they're not very dirty, so they do that in the cleaning station. But anything that get is going to a different animal needs to be taken to cleaning and sanitation and go through a whole cleaning process. This should be away from the where the animals are being walked, where people are walking, so they can't come through the wastewater and drag that through the facility, because you're going to have all bowls, everything coming through there, so the potential for contamination goes up if that's not being controlled. You want running hot water whenever possible, and certainly cold water. And then the routine, everything comes there, you rinse it to rinse off any of the organic matter that's on any bowls or floors or whatever it is, rinse it off, then it goes into a wash, it gets washed, and this is like a dish detergent, like Dawn. So you're washing the bowls, you rinse them, it goes into a sanitation after that. So that's your bleach solution. It needs to be in contact for a minimum of 10 minutes, and then it gets rinsed again, and it gets dried, either hand dried or air dried. Um, the, there's a question, oh, actually I missed a couple questions. Um, do you have to track all supplies coming in and going out? 
Uh, that's going to depend on your operation as far as tracking them. I highly recommend that yes, you are tracking supplies, particularly the donations that are coming in from the public. You may have people who um, want receipts for that kind of stuff. But I would recommend that you have, and that's your um, facilities or your logistics, um, maybe working together on doing those kind of things, but you have people who are focused just in that area to track stuff. And then from that, from your warehouse, they're keeping track of what's in there and when you're running low of something because the feeding cleaning stations are stocking from the warehouse area. So that area is the one area that is, if it starts to run low there, they know that it, the, they have to restock so the cleaning feeding stations never run low. Um, there's another question about for animals with specific diets, does the food remain on the kennel containing the animals? That can be a challenge. Um, ideally, yes. And what you have in a co-located shelter, you'll have owners that are bringing in um, their own food or the specialty diet food. And so for those animals, the people are going to want their animal to be fed that food. If it's a shelter that other people from the public can access, I've seen people will just grab the nearest food and then they're giving it to their animals, which really upsets the owner for, I mean, obvious reasons who brought that food in the first place. So controlling the environment, if you have the food with that cage, then you have to ensure that it's not going to be used or walk off with somebody else, which can be challenging. So I don't know that I answered that um, because it's challenging. You're going to have to look at your environment and determine whether or not you're able able to keep it with the kennel and then actually make sure that animal gets it. It may be something that if it stays at the shelter that there's um, at, when they walk in um, and check into the shelter that that particular owner picks up that food and takes it. If it's something specific to, I mean, if it's owners not taking care of the animals, it's the volunteers and staff taking care of the animals, then another option is that it states on the daily care sheet that this animal only gets canned food because it has no teeth or it only gets this special diet food. Um, and that will say on the card so that the people when they're feeding go get that food and get that particular bowl set up for the animal. So, um, waste is huge. So daily waste is going to be everything. And so we clean with paper towels. So that that means a lot of paper towels for every single pen. So you're spraying down the pen and wiping it out and drying it with paper towels. All of that's being thrown away. Um, gloves. You should be changing gloves between every single animal. So that's a lot of gloves. And then the animal waste, um, <coughs> excuse me, in the exercise yard, the animal handlers are picking up the waste as it, you know, as a, a dog has a bowel movement, they're picking up the feces, throwing it away in the trash cans outside the facility. And then um, if you're putting any kind of towels into the cages when those get dirty those are generally being thrown away we certainly don't have access to a washer in the disaster shelter you may be saving them and they're you know a local shelter is taking them back to their facility and washing them or you know once them when they're done um, but potentially you're throwing all of that stuff away so it, it creates an immense amount of of trash you're going to need to have dumpsters Placement of the dumpsters should be away from the main entrance and um, particularly depending on what waste you're putting in there, if you're putting bodies into that, you want to make sure you're following protocols for any bodies that may be going into the dumpsters um, and which dumpsters those would go into. You're going to have to look at how often those dumpsters get dumped to where it may start out that you think you're going to be able to do it just every other day or every couple days and you find out you're having to do it every single day or need an additional dumpster. Your restrooms. Um, one of the things that I look at anytime I walk into a disaster shelter is look at where the restrooms are in the shelter. And so if these are fully operating part of the, the structure, um, 
where they're placed matters in where animal housing is. We don't want to deny somebody access to the restrooms, but if it's in the heart of our animal housing, then we have to be able to control that environment. We can't have somebody just coming up and saying, oh, you know, I just, I just need to go to the bathroom, and then they're wandering around the shelter, potentially stealing animals. I mean, anything can happen. So um, consider portables. Portables should be out near the entrance of it. I mean, obviously not right in the way, but somewhat out in the entrance of the um, facility. And you may need both, where the operating um, fully functioning is for your staff volunteers in the shelter, and then the rest of it is for, um, for the um, public. So here's an example of, um, uh, I mean, just, you know, a basic looking at a facility. So you're coming in the front lobby here. You're coming in the entrances. If you have multiple doors leading people in, controlling which doors they're coming in, restrooms here at the front, now you can control this space because this space up front is just simply for public coming in. Once they get back into this area, this is the area that you're going to have for all of your other stuff. Intake is going to have proprietary information on that paperwork, owners' names, their phone numbers, um, addresses. All of that stuff, we need to secure everything that's going to be in the rest of this area and including if this is the loading dock and we have supplies coming in here, we want to be able to control that as well. So looking at, looking at your shelter, um, one of the things here, if I know that my exercise yard is in here, where I'm placing my nice straight lines, huh? Um, where I'm placing my housing, my initial thought when I'm walking in a shelter supervisor and saying, okay, this is a good area to start thinking about placing my dogs because I've got the exercise area right here. And so in that area, is where I want to have those animals placed. Now with that what I have to consider then is additionally are all animals being locked in that exercise area? Because if all animals are being locked in that exercise area that means my aggressives are being locked in this area. They may be simply animal aggressive animals that you know they're not vicious animals hopefully. Vicious animals are going to be a completely different story and those animals we don't want in the facility and if they are we're not walking those animals. They're, um, they're only being removed um, for cleaning purposes and there's going to be special considerations for how you're handling them. If I only have this one exercise area what I'm not exercising are animals from an isolation area. ISO animals may be able to be exercised depending on vet recommendation, but if they are being exercised, they're going to have to be in a separate exercise area than where my healthy animals are. So if I, like I said, so if I initially am planning that area for the dogs, that's because of the exercise area. If I've got cats looking up in the area here, because if I've got intake in this area, Oops, didn't draw. If I have intake, sorry, my draw pen doesn't seem to work. Um, if I've, anyway, try this arrow. If I have intake in this area, because the people are coming in from the public, I've got my dogs back in this back area. By putting my cats up in this area, I've got them away from where the dogs are, I've got them away from the general public, and your intake is down here. You can funnel your cats right up into this area where you're controlling the access as people come in through the, in through the front entrance. And then I've got other areas back in here 
loading dock is here so I can put my supplies back here and then potentially put other specialty animals um, in those other quieter areas as well. Does anybody have any questions on any of that? Okay, so here's some of the breakdown. Um, you can see in some of the planning on where animals went. So you've got your dog ha housing, you've got your dog intake, and then you've got your small animal and cat intake that you could funnel over there. And so this whole area is your intake area, but you're breaking up and controlling that environment from um, from the very start by separating them on the intake area. Donations and supplies in the back corner so it's coming right off of the loading dock and then from that corner you're able to then take your supplies and you're funneling them over this way to dogs you're funneling them up here into the cat and small animal area if you have so many donations um, that you can't keep them in the shelter this may be just a small stock area you may have to have another area either in another building or another back um, storage container or something back here that you can house them depending on how large this operation really is and then if you notice your cleaning and sanitation area back here that's assuming that you can contain that there's drains back here there's water access but it's outside the entire facility so supplies are going to be coming your stuff is going to be coming out the back into this area for the cleaning and then can go back into the shelter afterwards, it's been cleaned or stored over in the supply area. So, um, so with this, the big thing looking at that you need to have a plan whenever possible that you've already seen the facility, you know what it looks like, you know what um, what potentially is coming into your operation based on the demographics of your community and then you can go through and take that design and you can plan out and map where things are. The big thing with it is recognizing that even when you go through and you lay out a plan you've created this setup and you say okay on paper this is what we think we're going to do and then all of a sudden you find out that you know well this this is just too small an area for the cats we're going to move them into this area back here and we only have a few small animals so we're putting them up in this area here by planning ahead you can lay those things out and say mm, yeah this may not work quite the way we thought it was going to work so we're going to change that up if it isn't working you need to fix it and certainly if you've gone through and you've done some exercises you've done mock scenarios you set it up you've played with it you're going to find what does and doesn't work so well maybe this front section bringing people in through this front lobby there isn't room for you to do both intakes here everybody's coming right through here with all the barking dogs it's backed up here so you can't make it work so you've got to completely change where this whole intake is and maybe you now need to move it over here and move this area over here you're able to start making those kind of plans by going through and doing the whole exercises but even if you've done that, you've laid out your plan, you've got it all on paper, you've mapped it out in the facility, you've done exercises and it worked beautifully, and then all of a sudden the disaster hits. And that changes absolutely everything. The best plans, once you get them into the facility and you start working with them, you're going to see the best plans that just didn't quite play out the way you thought it was going to play out and so you're going to have to fix it and it's it, it it's challenging to reorganize the shelter after you've been up and operating everybody's already tired the animals are you know kind of in their routines and now you're messing with it <coughs> excuse me but it's certainly better if you do that um, at the beginning and then you can make it more efficient as it goes and some of that is even 
the aisleways between cages are too close and then there's one aisleway that's really large so you just slide everybody over. If you don't fix those things in the beginning, you're never going to come up with an efficient, well-flowing operation and it it adds a lot of additional stress to the operation. The first three days of any disaster is absolute chaos and then you'll find that the animals start getting into a routine, the people start getting into the routine, everything kind of calms down. If you've got a set feeding time and a set exercise time, particularly for the dogs, you'll find that some of the pens are going to start staying cleaner because the animals know that as soon as the people show up, they're going to start getting us out and walking them so they can they don't go to the bathroom, they wait. Or in the afternoon, the same thing, that they know kind of the routine, that they've had a break time, lights have been turned down in the middle of the day. As soon as the lights come on, that means we're going to get back outside to start going to the bathroom again. And so when they get that routine, they get that level of comfort, it flows much better. But if you have problems in it's too congested in a particular area or you need to move animals around because of behavioral stuff, if you don't take care of those things, you're never going to get into that efficient, well-flowing operation. So, um, this went much faster. Um, are there any questions anybody wants to type in anything I didn't cover? I see typing so um, keep in mind that the more planning the more preparing you do ahead of time um, the more efficient everything is going to be when the operation happens but you also need to recognize you may go in and you're setting up expecting evacuations you're expecting the fire Pe lots of people are going to be evacuated you go in you set up the shelter and then nobody comes or only a few people come and then everybody gets to go back home. <coughs> um, it's, I mean, that's ideal, obviously, because we want people to be able to go back home as quickly as possible or not be evacuated. Um, but there's a lot of factors that are going to come into play that always plan for the worst that you have things available, you know, for when people come in. Um, there's a question, should there be a check-in, check-out for owners um, taking their animals for walks? Yes. You should have everybody, when they, they should check in when they come to the facility. That's going to be your intake area, um, and or depending on the size of it, it may be multiple doors and they're coming into their particular unit. If they're coming in through multiple doors, you have to have those doors staffed and then people will check in. If they have ID, which they won't always, they're grabbing their animals and they're running and they don't have ID, you at least, least need to have some way of checking them in. I recommend the ID collars, those ID bands that were put on the animals, that you put an ID band on the owners who are going to be walking their animals regularly. It will have the animal's ID number on it, so you can confirm that the people should be in there. If you have multiple units or multiple areas that people are at, you could have multiple covered bands. So you have red bands for a particular unit of animals, you have blue bands for another unit, and then that way you can even check who's in the different areas and whether or not they should be in those areas. Um, walking them, exercising them and taking them out of the area, if you can have a controlled space for where the animals are being walked so people aren't taking them off site, but you may have people who want to pick them up and take them to a park or take them to a family's or something like that. They're their animals so they can do that, but if they are going to be leaving site with them, they need to know your hours of operation so that they're, they're not bringing them back you know, after you've already closed for the night because then they're going to be responsible for keeping them. And you also need to know that if they are taking the animal, they're going to be gone for long periods. 
that you can maybe put a card on that cage or mark the cage so that you know your volunteers aren't freaking out because they can't find that animal and it's been gone all day that you have a way of designating and saying the owner has it out um, how many backup shelter locations should you have if your primary is the fairgrounds it's going to depend on what your backup locations are is there the capacity at those locations to accommodate what you would accommodate at the fairgrounds because um, you're going to need to look at that what the capacity is and compare it to the capacity of those other shelters um, I I don't think you can have too many backup plans so because even if it's not the fairgrounds that's got something going on there could be some event or something else that going on at one of the locations so the more locations you have it gives you more options those options also come into play when you have um, a, like a different area of the community that is affected by the disaster like how the Red Cross does it where they have different shelters around an area and they can open a shelter up based on um, the proximity to the need you could do that as well with those additional locations part of having those backup plans is also knowing what the availability is and so fairgrounds if there is a disaster do they have a space that you can use these barns if we don't have fair going on or you could use this space over here if we do have the fair going on um, do you try to take pictures of all the animals coming into the facility yes um, and we'll we'll go into a lot more detail in the next one um, we're going to talk um, standard operating procedures for the small animal shelter and then the fourth one is standard operating procedures for the large animal shelter um, but as part of the procedures for intake I highly recommend you get a photo of the animal that you can put on the cage as part of the cage card and a photo of the owner and the animal that can go into the file um, for the for the animal which will help with reclaiming that animal also um, what would you consider a minimum space for a shelter building size uh, that's a great question and I can't give you an answer to that because you have again it's capacity how many animals do you expect to come into the facility and what is the purpose of the facility if it's a co-located shelter and you're saying then you you can guesstimate how many people I mean you can specifically state we can take 10 animals in this co-located shelter the first 10 families that show up with an animal they can bring them to that facility so you're going to have those kind of options available um, and the other thing is looking at if it's a stray shelter look at, at at just really the capacity of the number of animals that you can house and then the backups if you end up having to do an overflow facility um, Uh, as far as can you get the presentation, um, you talk with um, Deborah Schnockenberg at Pet Aid. I know she's going to post these online um, so that you have access to those, but I, I double check with her to see about as far as getting a copy of the presentation. <coughs> um, oh, yeah, kittens are notorious for escaping kennels. Um, yes, yes, they are. And so one of the things that you can do with small animals or with litters of kittens, the size, the type of kennel and the size of the kennel, a large kennel for litters of kittens or litters of puppies is not going to be an ideal setup. You're going to want to have, and, and I recommend for, for, um, moms and litters is that you have them in a kennel in an airline kennel because you can control that environment much better they can't escape 
generally they're not that small if they can get out of an airline kennel um, and it's also a safer more confined space for moms that they just feel safer in that environment with their with their young um, if it's a hot environment and you're using an airline kennel that only has the vent holes at, generally the vent holes are at the top if you flip those kennels upside down then you'll have the vent holes at the bottom so you can put your animals in there and you will still get a decent amount of airflow um, or you can, may even be able to do a smaller wire kennel and they can't escape out of those um, but you're going to have to check the bottoms and make sure the floor is secured because if they can push the floor then they can escape out the front or the back of it so you may need to um, zip tie that in place. And then do you have SOPs for dangerous animals? Um, uh, what process to take in identifying when to have them removed from the shelter? <coughs> um, we'll talk some of those SOPs with intaking animals. Um, identifying the dangerous animals and then handling them anything I mean and it's up to shelter leadership to make those determinations we've had animals actually I had an animal in Hurricane Sandy that I refused entry into the shelter um, we simply would not take that animal because we didn't have housing that would accommodate it it was um, it was a very large, highly, highly aggressive animal um, to the point where the owner really wasn't even able to manage that animal. And so I simply told the animal control officer that brought it in that we could not do that and they would need to find another location. So a vet clinic, um, there wasn't an animal control facility that could house it. Um, so be willing to protect the majority of your population, people and animals. If you can accommodate it, then it absolutely has to be removed from the facility. If it can be accommodated by using a catch pole to remove it, because I mean, catch poles by um, well, highly skilled handlers, catch poles are magnificent pieces of equipment because it can be used as a stiff lead and that's it. It's simply a stiff lead and so you're taking the animal very gently out of the cage, cleaning the pen and putting it back in. Um, if you can accommodate those kind of things then take the animal. If you can't safely manage and accommodate and provide adequate care for the animal then then you need to get it to a different location and have planned out with um, a mutual aid agreement with a shelter or a vet clinic or somebody who could help accommodate those kind of animals. So are there any other questions? All right, well, oh, wait, we got typing. All right, well, it seems like there are no more questions. So um, I guess being done early, you get um, some extra time. I apologize if I didn't cover anything uh, or if I went too fast, but hopefully you got what you needed. Uh, and then next week, we're gonna go into detail standard operating procedures um, for setup and running of the small animal shelter. So, all right, thank you everyone.